predicting inflation. It's a uh, it's the economic puzzle that keeps everyone on edge, doesn't it? From households trying to budget for groceries to, well, central banks setting interest rates. It really does. We're all constantly trying to see what's coming next, but those shifts can feel so sudden, so unpredictable. Exactly. So what if a completely different kind of brain, you know, an artificial one, could give us a clearer picture. That's the really fascinating question, isn't it? And it's right at the heart of some new research coming out of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. Ah, uh, okay. You see, the difficulty with forecasting inflation, as anyone who's uh, tried to plan their finances or run a business knows, it stems from how incredibly complex it is. Right. It's not just one thing. It's the outcome of millions of individual economic decisions all tangled up together. And crucially, it's heavily influenced by what we all think is going to happen with prices down the road. That expectations part. Right That's there. the really slippery element, isn't it? It absolutely is. It makes it so tricky to, you know, pin down accurately. So for decades, the main tools have been things like expert surveys the Survey of Professional Forecasters, the SPF, that comes to mind. Right, or looking at consumer sentiment surveys, market signals. And those incredibly complex mathematical models, the DSGEs, yeah. dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. Yeah, well, those two. But I mean, as this new research itself highlights, even the best of these traditional methods often, well, they miss the mark, sometimes by quite a bit. And let's be honest, running those big surveys and complex models, that takes serious time and money. It really does, which is exactly where this idea of using artificial intelligence uh, comes into play. OK. Imagine taking these massive language models, the tech behind things like ChatGPT or Google's AI, and pointing them at economic forecasting. Could they analyze data in a totally new way, maybe give us a more accurate prediction? So this deep dive is about digging into that specific possibility based on that Fed research. Precisely. It's a study by Federal Reserve economists Miguel Foria y Castro and Fernando Le Bubici. They specifically investigated whether large language models or LLMs, specifically Google AI's Paul M model, could actually be a better predictor of inflation than what we've been using. OK, so the core question is, can an AI trained on just mountains of text data actually outperform the traditional tools economists have relied on for so long? Could this be like a genuine game changer for economic forecasting? That really is the central idea they explored. Think about what these LLMs are fundamentally built to do. Mm. Models like OpenAI's GPT-4, or in this case, Google's Polym, they excel at finding patterns, subtle relationships within language, within text. How do they learn that? Well, at a basic level, they learn by predicting the next word in a sentence over and over on unimaginable amounts of text. And in doing that, they absorb a huge amount of information about the world, including economic trends, indicators, even the sentiment expressed in news articles or reports. It's like they're reading the economic tea leaves, but on a scale a human could never manage. Kind of, yeah. But we've all heard the warnings about AI being a black box, right? Mm. It's hard to know exactly how it reaches its conclusion. So how did the researchers tackle that? That's a really important point. How do you trust a forecast if you don't understand the reasoning? It is definitely a challenge. But the St. Louis Fed team, they came up with a really um, a really clever methodology to try and rigorously test the LLM's forecasting ability despite that black box nature. All right, let's get into the nuts and bolts then. How exactly did they put this AI, Paul M, through its paces? OK, so they specifically used Google's Paul M model, the Bison 001 version, which is built on an earlier model called LAMDA. And why Paul M? Were there specific reasons? Yeah, two main ones, according to the paper. First, at the time they were doing the research, Paul apparently had access to more up-to-date training data compared to some other big models. OK, recency matters. It does. And second, crucially for academic work like this, Google offered free API access, which let them run the large number of tests they needed without breaking the bank. Makes sense. So they didn't just ask it, hey, Paul, and what's inflation going to be next year? It was more sophisticated. Oh, much more sophisticated. They used what they called conditional forecasts. Conditional forecasts. What does that I, mean? Imagine prompting the model, telling it to act as if it were a specific date in the past. Let's say February 15th, 2020. Right before the pandemic really hit globally. Exactly. And then they'd ask it to predict inflation for the coming quarters. But and this is the key part, using only the information that would have been publicly available up to that specific date, February 15th, 2020. Ah, that's brilliant. It's like putting the AI in a time machine and saying, based only on what you knew then, what did you expect to happen? Precisely. 
It simulates real-time forecasting conditions. They ran these kinds of simulations for various dates starting in 2019, going right through the pandemic and into the first quarter of 2023. So they covered quite a turbulent period. And the forecast lengths. They looked at horizons from the current quarter, so Q0, all the way out to four quarters ahead, Q4, which mirrors the structure used by the Survey of Professional Forecasters, the SPF. Makes for a good comparison. Could you give us an example? What would one of those prompts actually look like? Sure. A typical prompt would be structured something like, assume that you are in specific date. Please provide your best forecast for the year-over-year -year seasonally adjusted CPI inflation rate in the United States for current quarter through four quarters ahead. Provide numerical values for each of these forecasts and do not use any information that was not publicly available as of specific date in formulating your predictions. Okay, so very specific instructions. Let's make it even more concrete. What about that February 15th, 2020 example? Yeah. What did they ask and what did Palm say? Okay, so for February 15th, 2020, the prompt essentially asked for forecasts for 2020 Q1 through 2021 Q1, using only pre-February 15th info. Right. Palm came back with specific numbers. It said something like 2020 Q1, 1.7%, 2020 Q2, 1.8%, 2020 Q3, 1.9%, 2020 Q4, 2.0%, 2 and 2021 Q1, 2.1%. A gradual increase towards 2%. Exactly. But what was also fascinating was that it provided reasoning. It mentioned things like the inflation level at the time, the Fed's policy stance, low unemployment, stable oil prices, and general expectations for moderate economic growth. Wow, it actually explained its thinking based on the available data. That's impressive. It is, isn't it? It gives you a glimpse into its process, even if it's still a bit of a black box. Did they try this later on, say, after the pandemic had clearly taken hold? Mm -hmm. to see if the AI adjusted. Oh, absolutely. They ran a similar prompt, but set the date to May 15th, 2020. Okay, deep into the initial phase of the pandemic then. Right. And the forecast shifted dramatically, as you'd expect. For the second quarter of 2020, the quarter they were in at that simulated date, it predicted a much lower 0.6% inflation rate. Reflecting the economic shutdowns. Exactly. But then it anticipated a rebound, forecasting 2.2% inflation by the second quarter of 2021. And again, it gave reasons. It explicitly mentioned the huge near-term impact of COVID-19, but also factored in expectations of an economic recovery later in 2020, plus the effects of monetary and fiscal stimulus. That's quite a dynamic adjustment. It really shows the model seemed to be processing the new uh, crisis-level information. It does suggest that, yeah. Now, this method of simulating the past is really neat, but technically, aren't these still what statisticians call in-sample forecasts? because the AI was ultimately trained on data that includes 2020, 2021, et cetera. That is a super important point, and the researchers are very upfront about it. It's a key limitation. Okay. Because they don't control Pelham's original training data, and that data isn't neatly timestamped in a way they can manipulate, you can't call these true out-of-sample forecasts in the strictest sense. Right. It might have seen the future during training. Potentially. However, this clever conditional forecasting approach gives strong evidence that the model can discipline itself that it can filter its knowledge and focus only on information available up to the simulated date. So it strongly suggests it's genuinely forecasting from that past perspective, not just recalling future events it learned during training. That's the argument, and it's quite persuasive based on their results. It gives us much more confidence than just asking for a simple forecast. Okay, so they ran all these conditional forecasts across different dates, different horizons. What were the big takeaways? How did Paul M. stack up against the actual human experts in the survey of professional forecasters? Well, the headline finding is pretty striking. Overall, when they looked at the mean squared errors, which is basically a measure of average forecast accuracy, lower is better. Paul M. generally had lower errors than the SPF. Lower errors meaning more accurate. Or more accurate, yes. This was true across most of the years they studied and at almost all the forecast horizons they looked at. Wow. So in many cases, this AI just trained on text, was actually making better inflation predictions than a survey of professional economists. That's what the results suggest. It's quite remarkable. So the AI was often more accurate. What about the pattern of their forecasts? Did the AI and the experts see inflation behaving similarly over time? That's where things get interesting. Both Paul M. and the SPF forecasts showed what the researchers called a gliding path, sort of gradually adjusting over time. Okay. 
But there was a key difference. The SPF forecast showed a much stronger, much faster tendency to revert back towards the Federal Reserve's 2% inflation target. So the Hewn experts kept predicting inflation would snap back to 2% fairly quickly. It seems so. Their forecasts showed a stronger pull towards that target. Paul M's forecasts, on the other hand, also reverted towards the target, but much more slowly, much more weakly. Huh. So the AI wasn't as convinced inflation would return to target so fast. Apparently not. The average speed of that reversion was significantly lower for Paul M compared to the SBF. It suggests maybe a different way of weighing the incoming economic signals, or perhaps less anchoring to the official target. That's a fascinating difference in behavior. Did one overshoot more than the other at any point? Yes. The data show that Paul M tended to overshoot inflation, predict it higher than it turned out to be more than the SPF did in late 2022 and early 2023. Okay. And were there specific years where the AI really shone or struggled compared to the SPF? Definitely. Pollen significantly outperformed the SPF, meaning it was much more accurate in 2020, 2021, and 2022, those highly volatile pandemic and recovery years. Interesting. But it actually underperformed, was less accurate in 2019, before the pandemic, and also in early 2023. So its advantage seemed greatest during the period of highest uncertainty and disruption. That seems to be the case, yes. What about those different forecast horizons? Was it better predicting next quarter or next year? The SPF actually had a slight edge for predicting inflation in the current quarter, the immediate term. Okay. But Paul M was better lower errors at all the other horizons. Mm -hmm. One quarter ahead, two quarters ahead, three and four. Especially one to three quarters out, its advantage was quite clear. So better for the medium term, basically. That's what the data indicates. Oh, and another small point, they found that for both Paul M and the SBF, the median forecast, the middle value if you rank them, was generally slightly more accurate than the simple average or mean forecast. Good to know. This is all really compelling, but Going back to that black box issue and the in-sample caveat, how did the researchers try to build confidence that these results weren't just, I don't know, a fluke yeah. or maybe hypersensitive to the exact way they asked the question? Right. Those are valid concerns. They performed several important robustness checks to address exactly those points. Like what? Well, one issue with LLMs is prompt sensitivity. Yeah. The idea that changing the wording slightly might drastically change the answer. They did experiment with variations in their prompts to check for this. Another challenge is reproducibility. LLMs often have some randomness built in, so asking the same question twice might not give the exact same answer. Right, I've seen that with chatbots. Exactly. So to handle that, they didn't just ask each question once. They generated a distribution of forecasts by querying the model multiple times for the same date and horizon. Then they focused their analysis on the average, mean, and the middle value, median, of those multiple responses. Ah, so they're looking at the central tendency of the AI's answers, not just one potentially random output. Precisely. It makes the findings much more robust. They even analyzed the variability or uncertainty in Palm's forecast by looking at the range between the 25th and 75th percentile of its answers, the interquartile range. And did that show anything interesting? Mostly what you'd expect, the uncertainty or spread in the forecasts generally increased the further out they were predicting. More uncertainty about inflation a year from now than next quarter. Makes sense. Yeah. What about that randomness factor itself? Did they play with that? They did. There's a setting in these models called temperature, which controls how random or creative the output is. Zero temperature means it tries to be as predictable and deterministic as possible. Higher temperatures allow for more variation. Okay. Their main results use the default temperature setting, but they also ran the analysis with temperature set to zero and set to the maximum value. And did that change the main conclusions? While the specific numbers shifted slightly, the overall core finding that Palm tended to outperform the SPF at those one to four quarter ahead horizons held up across these different temperature settings. That definitely adds confidence. What? Okay, what about reinforcing the idea that the model is actually respecting the timeline? that it could condition on past data. Yes, they did another clever test for that, what they called an ex-post forecast exercise. Ex-post, meaning after the fact. Right. They basically asked Paul M about historical inflation rates without giving it any date restrictions, just asking what was inflation in, say, 2021 Q2. Okay, just asking it to recall known history that was definitely in its training data. Exactly. And in those cases, Paul M's answers closely matched the actual realized historical inflation data. 
But crucially, those recall answers were significantly different from the conditional forecasts it gave when it was asked to pretend it was an earlier date. Ah, I see. So when it was asked to forecast from, say, early 2020, its answers for 2021 were different than when it was simply asked to state the known inflation for 2021 later on. Precisely. This provides strong evidence that the conditional prompting was working, that the model was genuinely attempting to forecast based on the limited information from the simulated past date, not just regurgitating known outcomes. That's a really smart way to check that. So even though the training data contained the future, the model seemed able to effectively ignore it when instructed. That's the interpretation, yes. It suggests the model has a capacity for this kind of conditional reasoning based on the prompt. They also did one more check using the initial real-time inflation data releases before any later revisions and found the overall results were broadly similar. Okay, this sounds incredibly promising then. So let's zoom out. What are the potential real-world implications here? Why should, you know, you, the listener, care about AI forecasting inflation? Well, I think the biggest implication is the potential for these LLMs to become a really valuable complementary tool for inflation forecasting. And importantly, a potentially much less expensive one than large scale surveys or running complex traditional models. So cheaper and based on the study, often more accurate. In many scenarios, yes. And as the technology keeps improving and the costs of developing and training these massive models presumably come down, they could become much more accessible. Accessible to whom? Well, potentially to smaller businesses trying to make pricing or investment decisions. Maybe even individuals looking for a more informed view on where prices might be heading. Could it help you plan your own finances better? It's possible. It really does feel like you could democratize access to sophisticated forecasting, doesn't it? Moving beyond just big institutions. That's certainly a potential long-term outcome. The researchers also point out that this approach could be incredibly useful for forecasting other economic variables where we just don't have good survey data or where it's prohibitively expensive to collect. Like what kind of variables? Maybe things like uh, really detailed labor market statistics for specific demographic groups or tracking household income trends in specific regions, areas where traditional methods struggle to provide timely or granular data. LLMs might be able to fill some of those gaps by analyzing text data. That could really open up whole new ways of understanding the economy in near real time. It absolutely could. So wrapping this up, the key takeaway is that this AI, Google's Paul M in this study, demonstrated a pretty remarkable ability to predict inflation, often doing better than the established survey of human experts just by processing text. That's the core finding from this really fascinating St. Louis Fed research, yes. The LLM showed promising capabilities outperforming the SBF in many of the scenarios they tested, particularly for forecasts looking a few quarters ahead. But we do need to keep that caveat in mind. These were technically in-sample forecasts, even with that clever conditional method they used. That's right. It's a limitation inherent in using pre-trained models where you don't control the training data timeline. However, the evidence suggesting the model can condition effectively on past information when prompted is, I think, a very significant and encouraging result in itself. Okay, so maybe the final thought for you, our listener, is this. What does this all signify for the future of how we understand and predict the economy? Could AI tools like these fundamentally change the game for economic forecasting? and maybe even level the playing field, putting powerful predictive tools into more hands. It certainly feels like we might be on the verge of a pretty significant shift in how we approach economic analysis and prediction. Absolutely. And if you're keen to really dig into the methodology, the specific results, all the tables and figures we alluded to, definitely look up the original research paper. It's titled Artificial Intelligence and Inflation Forecasts by Fourier Castro and Leibovici in a St. Louis Fed Review. A really thought-provoking read. 